back, everyone. At this point, we'll move on to the next breakout session, which will be moderated by Dr. Dr. Lakshmi Goel. Dr. Goel is the Graduate Program Director of uh, Masters of Business Administration here at the University of North Florida. She is also a professor in the Coggin College of Business and serves as a UNF faculty liaison for the Coggin Study Abroads Program. Our panelists today are Dr. Felix Padilla and Dr. Irvin Pedro Cohen. Dr. Padilla has been a university professor for more than 30 years at Yale and other Ivy League schools. He is a renowned author of seven academic books and is an avid keynote speaker. Dr. Cohen earned his doctor in organi organizational leadership and urban education from Nova Southeastern University. He is an active member of the UNF Dean's Educational Advisory Council and is the executive director of Newtown Success Zone. He is also the author of A Charge to Keep, The Changing Black Church Post-Civil Rights, and his blog can be read at irvincohen.com. Together by sharing personal and professional experiences, they will discuss how self-reflection, global awareness, and critical thinking have helped them influence community activists. Thank you, everyone. How about a round of, round of applause for the yes. panel? Take it away. I think we're on. Is this working? Yeah. Check. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning, panelists. Um, I think there's an on button. Dr. Padilla is not on. I don't think I'm on. Hello? Sure. There we go. You all set? All right. I'm all set. All right. Good morning. Um, it's really exciting to be here, and it's great to see all of you here. Um, we had a very, very interesting opening talk by Dr. Conrad, um, who talked about the importance of elasticity and the right mindset to success. And in this panel, we're going to discuss another pretty fun uh, but very important topic and that's authenticity um, and the importance of being self-aware uh, as you transition into leadership roles and uh, I'm really excited to have these two gentlemen here to talk about it because they've done so much and achieved so much in their professional careers that has tied back to uh, authenticity uh, as being an important ingredient in their success. Um, so I'd like to open the panel by just asking uh, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Padilla to talk about how they feel self-awareness has contributed to their achievements. Um, well, I guess I'll start and I'll say um, self-awareness for me personally is, is that opportunity to do a checkup and make sure that you're in line with ultimately where you think you should be. Um, sometimes we, we have an, um, an unabashed way of ignoring what the universe is telling us we should do and we do everything to counteract that. And so self-awareness is that moment in time when you say to yourself, am I in line with ultimately what I am destined to do or what I am destined to become? And I say that in particular, you know, as we come out of um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And self-awareness for me is sort of like a, a lady performing a self-examination. And if you notice something is out of line, then it's your opportunity, one, to address it, or two, to get it checked out. And so self-awareness is that moment that you have where you say to yourself, am I in line with ultimately what the universe has planned for me to do? Okay, well, for, for me, uh, Self-reflection, self-awareness. Is this working? I don't think so. It's, it's not working either. Biggest <laughs> <laughs> push. Oh no. Oh, here we go. 
Uh, I, I like to complicate things a little bit because uh, self-reflection, self-awareness for me is where everything starts. Uh, but what is that? What, what is self-reflection? What is self-awareness? Um, particularly when we live in a society that is so busy or tries to get us to be so busy um, whereby we have no time for self. Um, Self-reflection actually, uh, particularly now in, 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 at this stage of my life, after moving from um, strictly a sociologist into someone who has become so much more spiritual in trying to merge the two fields. Um, Self-reflection means my ability to go beyond the mind. Because the mind for me represents all the knowledge, all the information that society in many ways has imposed on us. You know, what we know is what we have learned from society. And, and, and so if we want to get to know self, and by the way, you know, society sets out to make everyone pretty much the same. Although we walk around claiming to, claiming to be authentic, claiming to be unique, and so on and so forth. But when, when you really look at us as a collective, we, we value the same things, we want the same things, we think the same way, and so on and so forth. And, and, and in so doing, we, we forget that there is a self in us that, that is longing, that is yearning to express itself. But we cannot get to that self unless we are capable of taking a little bit of time uh, for me, it has to happen every day. Set a little bit of time aside and, and then just start reflecting by trying to go beyond this mind that is always talking, that is always trying to get us to think about other things than, than self. So self-reflection gives me an opportunity uh, to do what I call transcend the mind. See what is in me that has nothing to do with my thoughts and my ideas. And pretty soon, pretty soon I get to this level. Um, the, 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 the keynote speaker was talking about um, emotional intelligence. I, I talk about intuitive intelligence, your, your intuitions, you know, your gut feelings, those, those emotions and feelings that, that convey, can convey so much wisdom. I want to get there. I, I want to know what my inside, that, that inner sphere, this, this world that lies within me, what is it telling me? What, what, what is it asking me to do? And the only way that I can get there, and the only way that I have gotten there, is by putting aside some time every day. You got to become very selfish. I have 10 minutes, I'm going to spend it right here, just listening to nothing else but this inner world where our greatness lies. I want to go beyond this mind because you know what the mind wants you to do. And that is certainly not to be in line with your true self. So self-reflection is, for me, is, is, is the beginning and the end. If, if we do not get to know who we are by reflecting on those real feelings that we, we carry, we, we cannot move forward. In, you know, the funny part about that is that you said two things that stuck out with me, Dr. Padilla. Nothing and self. And, you know, we live in a society that has conditioned us that we always have to be doing something. We have to be doing something. And, and you know, as I look out into the audience and I look into the faces of young people, technology has really increased the need, the perceived need to do something. But as I was sharing this morning with, um, with someone, I enjoy, and I mean, I'm talking about, I enjoy it like nobody else's business, the ability to do nothing. I mean, I could do it on my back, I could do it on my side, I do it with my eyes closed, I mean, nothing. And I don't feel bad about doing nothing. But we have been conditioned 
that, you know, as thought leaders or just people in general, that we have to be doing something all the time. And it's only in those moments of nothingness that you really and truly have the authentic ability to have self-reflection and self-actualization. I mean, it's amazing how, and I'm not an overly um, religious person, but you know, we were all created out of nothingness. But we have been conditioned that we got to be doing something all the time. That's an amazing thing to me. Yeah. Well, you know, some of my students, uh, my policy in the classroom is that when you come into my classroom, I belong to you and you belong to me. So therefore, all the cell phones have to be turned off. I tell my students, look at your cell phones. Uh, well, first of all, you gotta give your cell phones a name. And when you come into my class, you, you tell your, your, your cell phone friend, uh, Maria, Jose, it's time to go to sleep. I now belong to Dr. Padilla. But it's really interesting because so many of my students tell me, well, I, I have to have the television on in order to go to sleep. And um, I tell them that I hardly watch television, that I try to be so in tune to myself that I push away any unnecessary distraction, right? Our society is all about distraction. So we, we have to know, we have to know this world. And you know, this is where the sociologist and me works wonders because I understand this world. And, and, and so our challenge is to challenge that world. It, it's to say, I know what you have to offer, but I am bigger, I'm greater than anything you have ever allowed me to see. I want to see the real me. Well, if you have the television on, it's not, it's not going to help you. If, if uh, you're listening to my lecture, and, and, and you're there, you know, texting, and, and you guys have gotten so good. I, I tell my students, my God, you know, you, you, you're looking at me. You, 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 you seem as if you're really in tune to what I'm saying because you're smiling at me, but yet you're really texting. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, that's <laughs> such a waste. You know, like we're wasting humans, you know. Right? This technology is, is, is producing lost humans before even humans have an opportunity to evolve. And, and that's really sad. It's interesting you mentioned the classroom. I teach uh, the MBA students here at UNF and they would hyperventilate if they didn't have access to email for more than 15 minutes because they're working executives and they think that if, that if they're not constantly doing something then the world around them is going to come crashing. Um, but, but talking about what we teach in the MBA program, um, a lot of the curriculum is based on skill development to succeed in the workplace. And when we talk about self-awareness and authenticity, uh, one, one of the ways in which it ties to success is that it's not just important for yourself, but if you are true to yourself, you're also sending the right signals to others that you can be trusted, right? Because if you're honest with yourself, you're going to be honest with those around you. And a good leader is somebody that inspires um, trust, someone that, that you can go to for advice, somebody, somebody whose decisions you can respect. Um, and, and in that way, I think authenticity also really ties back as a very important leadership trait. What, do you, what, do you, some, what are some of your thoughts on well, that? You know, I, I was going to add a, a point to, to this process of self-reflection because you know, we, we have to get to the point that we move from thought to feelings. And it has to get to the point where we, we become the authentic self, which means we, we've raised our consciousness to what I call a planetary self, a global self, a universal self. And in the 21st century, I, I really believe that the call is for us to become this universal humanity that we were meant to be. You know, no more divisions, no more separations. But as we begin to self-reflect, we gotta get to the point where we see this self connected to all that there is, connected to the universe, connected to Earth, connected to everything. And therefore, 
Self-reflection is not just for the sake of self-authenticity, but to the authenticity of the world. And we want to step out and, and, and meet up with anyone and say, you know, we are connected. And I don't know who you are, but I feel you. So to what degree can we engage ourselves in, in this process of reflecting on who we are so that we can, in a literal sense, catch up? Catch up with the world because the world is there waiting for us. The world is calling us. But if, if we just consume all of our time thinking about, I'm doing this because I need to know who I am. And it's important that I know who I am. And it, it, it is. But who you are cannot be separated from what the world is. Who you are cannot be a, a, a segment a compartment outside of this larger world. And, and see, that's the beauty. I, in my own evolution, um, I, I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I lived many years in Chicago, mostly among uh, Latinos and African Americans. And then something happened, <laughs> which I don't have any time to talk about, but I, I got to college, and, and, and then I went on to become a professor. But how my consciousness has expanded to the point that being Puerto Rican, being of color, is no longer what defines me. I have gotten to the point where it is my humanity that defines me. You know, my ability to love. And to love not from the mind because I have to love, but to, to love from within because I feel people. And that's a big difference. You know, the challenge that many of us face is that moment we take to have self-realization. Because it forces you to deal with the self. It forces you to look inside and see the self. And sometimes we're not really happy with what we see. And the moment you know that, you can't unknow it. You can't act like, you know, when you discover, I'm really not a nice person. You can't go back to being something that you already know. For me, those, that, that moment occurred when I started spending time um, practicing the Zen Buddhist tradition of meditation. And for me, you know, at that point in my life, I was single, lived in Atlanta, and worked for Nike. I mean, my job was to hang out with stars and enjoy the star treatment. But when I started to realize, you know, and had, started having those moments of self-actualization, I had to ask myself, what am I doing personally that contributes to the larger cause of humanity? And I couldn't go back to being that guy that enjoyed, you know, the VIP treatment and all the stuff that came with, you know, being that guy. I found myself moving towards a greater cause of humanity. And as Dr. Padilla said, I started to serve humanity. Thus, I found myself in the role as the executive director of the Newtown Success Zone. I can assure you when I graduated from UNF, that was not on my to-do list. And like many of you all in the audience today, my, my goal in life was to get paid. I knew what living on the other side of the tracks was. I mean, I, I had a firm grip on that personally. And so I wanted to make sure that I consumed as much resources as humanly possible. But the moment I had that moment of clarity, as I like to call it, it changed the scope of what I wanted to do. And I wanted to be a contributing member to humanity where my footprint left and you know the creator was able to say, you did a great job, my friend. I'm real happy with you. And you start to see yourself in the eyes of the people that you serve. And so I serve people that oftentimes I have nothing in common with. I'm talking about absolutely nothing. But again, my goal every day, even when I 
put this chair down was that you see your greater good in all the work that I do. Well, it, from a business perspective, it's really interesting. We, we talk about authenticity and self-awareness as being something that you have to do for yourself, but if you zoom out and look at how businesses function and how societies and, and countries function, a lot of the mess that we are in today with the financial crisis and the need for being socially responsible, environmentally responsible, all of that could have been avoided in some sense or at least mitigated if people were true to themselves, if people were doing what they, they thought was right for themselves and, and for the society. So that notion of connectedness really does matter in, in real terms, even from a business perspective. Um, I just want to switch gears uh, a little bit and talk about uh, something that Dr. Padilla brought up, is being able to express or emote. And that's not something that comes naturally to a lot of people, to be able to express emotions. Um, you know, so, so to externalize what you're feeling within yourself. Uh, how important do you think it is to emotionally express yourself so that you can project your true self and also inspire others and, and, and transform others around you? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I approach, and maybe it's because I'm a sociologist, I, I approach uh, emotions um, a little bit differently, I, I believe. Um, I'll plug in the work that I'm doing. I'm working on a new book, and uh, looking at the the uh, the love and intelligence of the heart, and what it comes from the heart, and, and, and emotions. Emotions in the traditional sense is something that was always has always been part of the physical human body. Um, the the, the whole concept of the divine feminine um, comes to mind when I think of, about emotions because men were part of the divine feminine up to about agriculture, which only happened 10 to 12,000 years ago. Now, if you can imagine um, that the first bipedal high brain species took his or her first step 2.5 million years ago. And agriculture only happened 10 to 12,000 years ago. It means that for, um, for over 2 million years, we lived as one. We were connected, you know, the, the emotions were part of men as it was part of, of women. You know, there, there, is, there was a divine masculine as well as the divine. But of course, we know that doubt separated and, and men um, somehow began to give themselves the illusion that, that they were different and more powerful than women and that we're supposed to do certain things uh, and so on and so forth. Personally, I too uh, was a Zen Buddhist for a long, long time. Um, I would go into meditation at times, <clears throat> and I would cry. Uh, right now, I, 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 I'm still meditating, and sometimes I go into these trance that I don't understand, and I feel this emotion. I, I feel it, and it's such a wonderful feeling. And I oft, often wonder, how, how do we people live without expressing those inner qualities that exist in them? See, we have learned to repress those emotions. And, and, and those emotions, for me, are part of this package of intelligence that gives us an insight into other people, into the world that most people do not have. You know, our idea, in, in, in my opinion, uh, the whole purpose, purpose of intellectualism is to enable, to enable you to see that which most people do not see. And how do you do that? Well, I'm not a woman, 
<laughs> but I know that my wife sees a lot of things that I don't see. And that's because she comes at it from deep within, because this is a built-in dimension of the divine feminine. Women have this emotion, and, and maybe that's why society fears women, because those emotions are not always logical or rational, right? But those are the emotions that make people do the impossible. You know, if, if you look at the great innovators, the great inventors, the great thinkers, I, I have this quote that I share with my students by Einstein, who says, not one of my invention ever came from the mind. Because he too was extremely spiritual, in the sense that he will work from, from within. So if you want to be an agent of change in society, if you want to be an innovator, a, a creator, uh, someone with a great imagination, you, you have to turn to your emotions. Because again, th there are, there's no creativity in the mind, although you know, we are made to believe that the mind is creative. The mind is creative when our inner being communicates to the mind creativity. It's not the other way around. It's from here to here, not from here to here. Uh, and so we're missing a lot. We're missing so much of who we are, of, 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 of this greatness that exists in us by just taking on the persona the society wants us to display every time we step out. Leave your emotions behind. And, and yet, that, that's really you know, what the, our, our gift. Our gift is, is, is the, the package of emotions and feelings that make us, and again, see where people cannot see. And if we all could see beyond the ordinary, we would be a totally different world. That's really interesting because one of the things that we've learned to do as a society is separate our professional and our personal selves. Oh, yeah. We talk about a work-life balance all the time and work is work and then life is everything else. Who you are, how you play, what makes you happy, why you cry. And, and I, I, I completely see your point. You're not going to get to that next step of creativity or innovation in your professional lives if you're not in touch with your personal life if, if, if you're looking at that. You know, the, the thing that I tell people all the time, I am my work. I mean, I am a constant service to the greater good and I am a constant service and in action to move the cause of humanity forward. I think we spend an amazing amount of time trying to, again, do something and we've and the whole idea of just being i mean being allows you to be in touch with your emotion you know i i, I was having a conversation with my 16 my 17 year old nephew around just being <coughs> and i said to him man it is so liberating to just cry sometimes and you know, can you imagine telling that to a 17 year old, I'm really tough kid, that sometimes his, uh, I, I still think I'm cool, he don't think I'm so cool, but you know, his cool uncle, that man, sometimes I cry. I mean, sometimes some things that, you know, you read or you hear about or a song, you know, just makes you feel some kind of way. And as men, we're taught to retain that emotion. Well, you know, the song this morning came on, <coughs> You're Beautiful, you know, and something about that song just naturally just moves me. And if it don't move you, I know you probably heard it over and over again, but when you first heard it, it was like, wow. That, that dude was feeling some real deep emotions and it came through and it touched me and I might have dropped one tear, but nonetheless, I did cry. Yeah. I mean, I'm, there is something liberating when you have the capacity to just be and emote your emotions. I laugh when something's really, really funny. I cry when something touches me. I mean, you know, the earlier speaker said, you know, no, no one can get you really mad, but I mean, I do get mad. I only stay mad for a couple of seconds, but I, I allow myself the liberation of being in whatever emotional state that the universe warrants, and that's okay. 
That's okay. We give females the right to cry. And you all, as ladies, hug each other and, girl, it's going to be okay. <laughs> but man, can you imagine a dude crying around another set of dudes? Oh my God, and he might really need to cry. That's a lot of built up tension. And again, as I moved to this self that I never knew existed, it allowed me to be in touch with all of those emotions. Now, I don't necessarily cry in front of people, but you know, I do cry. Right. And it's perfectly okay. But we've put these barriers around who can do what relative to their emotions. If you laugh too much, you're not serious. If you cry too much as a guy, you're soft. If you cry too much as a lady, you are emotional. I mean, wow. Those are self-imposed barriers. And what we have to be prepared to do is take the shackles off ourselves and liberate ourselves. I mean, there is a, I assure you, there is a beautiful freedom that exists when you simply just allow yourself to be. Well, I'm, I'm sure all the women in the room would agree we have our own emotional barriers, right? It's, it's not about hugging each other and crying. You cannot always do that. Uh, but I, I come from a society, I'm from India, and I come from a society that's predominantly male-dominated in, in every field, in every aspect. And it's funny that you mentioned the, the, supr the supreme feminine. The divine. The, the divine, divine feminine. The divine feminine. Uh, is anyone from India in this room? Okay. That one person. Oh, I am. Yeah, you're from India? I'm from the world. From the world, there you go. Well, we, uh, in the, India celebrates their New Year slightly differently. It's based on a solar calendar, and we had our New Year yesterday. And on our New Year, Diwali, probably heard of it, the Festival of Lights. Does anyone know who we worship on Diwali? At the back. Lakshmi, right? And that's, that happens to be my name. And Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth. Lakshmi is the most popular name for women in India because it's a goddess of wealth, right? Everyone wants their daughter to be Lakshmi. But she is, uh, I mean, Indians have about 3,000 gods and goddesses, so it's not really all that great to be named after one. But she's one of the more powerful ones, right? And it's, it's funny that we have this, this figure who represents wealth and prosperity and success that's actually a woman. Right? And yet we are a society that's male dominated. Mm -hmm. So it did, it did take me a lot to kind of come out of that and you know, be where I am today. Um, and a lot of that ha has been what this country has, has allowed me to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's been a journey to, to get to, to where I am. So it, I'd like you to talk about some of the obstacles that you faced uh, to get to where you are in your professional lives. Uh, you know, I think the number one obstacle for me was um, really understanding what I was placed on this earth to do. Um, and, you know, people talk about finding your passion early. Well, I didn't find my passion until later. And so finding that passion that allowed me to do what it is that I love to do and it doesn't feel like work. I mean, you're going to be working a really long time in your life. And, and to have to go somewhere that is, it's laborious to get up in the morning. And I think that for me was just a major obstacle. Is, you know, although I worked for a really cool company, had a really sexy job, it wasn't my passion. And so, you know, that was an obstacle for me. And then sometimes, you know, even in my current role, people aren't nice. I mean, you know, you are trying to help them and they're just not nice. They're just not receptive to your help. And so while that's a constant, you know, obstacle, it's an obstacle that when you're doing what you are, what you were predestined to do, it allows you not to own that portion of it. But, you know, prior to this point in my life, it was figuring out what it was that I wanted to do every day for the rest of my life. I mean, that was a major internal obstacle that I had to um, personally overcome. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we have the freedom to shift the question a little bit, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because if, if I was to talk about w w what inspired me to get here, we'll be here for a long, long time. Uh, I, if you don't mind, I, I want to talk about the obstacles that I face 
uh, as a university professor, particularly as a college professor who teaches sociology, uh, because it's relevant. Uh, I, I think the biggest challenge for me is, is to convince my students that, that there is a different and greater reality in the world than the reality in, in which we live. That, that we have been socialized, conditioned to um, embrace the world as we know it, but that my job is to teach them that there's greatness in them to create a reality different than the one in which we live. Um, when you look at our world today where there's so much inequity, where the exploitation, uh, the victimization of people is so common, where you see the great divide in the United States in terms of income, you know, 1% of the population seems to be the, the definers of the world and everybody else follows, right? Um, it seems to me that we need to change this world. And how do we change this world? Well, uh, Einstein, one of his fam famous quotes is, you cannot change a problem with the same consciousness that created the problem. So you have to undergo a shift in consciousness, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so this is my struggle. My struggle is how can I tell these, these beautiful young minds that yes, we, yeah, this is the world in which we live and, and, and we have to learn how to live in the world because we are in and of the world, but maybe we're here to create a better world. And it's not that I'm disappointed. I, I teach a couple of classes now and then, and I, I get my 30 students, and I often wonder how many students did I touch mm -hmm. during the course of the semester? How many students became convinced that there's more to life than what they're experiencing? Mm -hmm. um, I share with them this, this very wonderful video. I, I forget the name. It's, it's a quantum physicist. Um, and it's built around the question, what would you do? What would you do if money was not an issue? What would you become? What would you pursue? How would you say, if money was not an issue, what would you do with your life? Mm. And I, I'm constantly showing that throughout the course of the semester because of course, you come here to get a degree to get a job. That's not how it was when I went to school. <laughs> and this is why I don't want to tell my story, because my story is it's, it's, it's not your typical story. I, I went to college because I didn't want to work. You know, I graduated from high school. I was a terrible high school student, but I didn't want to go to work, so I went to college. And I thought that college was this wonderful place where you will go and sit under the mango tree and, and read books and intellectualize with your professors. And I didn't have an idea what I wanted to do, but now they do. Dr. Padilla, I need to get a degree because I need to get a job. And I tell them, but I want to teach you knowledge. I, I, I want you to, to, to grasp this whole idea that there's more to life than this work. You're going to get a job. You're going to work for 30 years. Postpone that as long as you can. My God. You're going to work for 30 years. Explore, right? I ended up being a sociologist at the very end. I didn't even know what I wanted at the end. Graduate school, that was, that was not in the cars. Going to Northwestern to study? No. And that was because I was, I was exploring. I was on this journey. I was venturing into this dark forest, the unknown, and I loved it. It, it was a different time, of course. Uh, I went to school in the 70s. I got my PhD in 1982. But, but I was, you know, it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, experience because you know, every day it was like, what's going to happen in the classroom today? Mm -hmm. So.
That's the obstacle. That's my obstacle. Trying to convince young minds because this is going to be their world. Mm -hmm. That we, we need a new world. We need a new earth. Mm -hmm. But looking at it from the other side of the argument, it is a huge risk, right, to shift your mindset from the world in which we live in, the reality, so to speak, to the world that should be or the ideal Absolutely. world. And uh, truth of the matter is money is important, Absolutely. right? A job is important. Um, having some kind of security for your future is important, Absolutely. especially maybe if there are other people that are dependent on your success. Yeah. Um, it, all of this becomes really important. So it is a huge risk and you have to be really bold to say that I am going to take this time to, to explore, for example, right. right? So where would you kind of, um, what would you point to uh, for somebody who's looking to make that shift for the courage to do so? You know, the, as you said that, I, I thought for one moment, it's a risk because you've given it all the power. What you say out of your mouth ultimately has to happen. And risk is risk because you said it's risky. No one told you it was risky. You declare that for me to do ultimately what I think I am destined to do is risky. And so you never do it. And then you find yourself doing things for, because you thought you had no other option. And so what we have to be very conscious of is what we say out our mouths because what we say out of our mouths ultimately gives what we think power. You know, people depending, I mean, I assure you, I'm the first in my family to go to college. Um, I'm the first to graduate from college at this point. Um, and so when the phone call comes for anything, it's me. Hey, um, you know, your nephew needs $300 to go to grad night or senior night, et cetera, et cetera. That call comes to me. So for me to stand in this place and space and do ultimately what I, what I think the universe has gifted me to do came with an amazing amount of risk. But I assure you there's something innately about this world that we live in that if you are prepared to take just one step all the things that you need in order to reach your destiny will be provided to you. Again, as I said before, I'm not an overly religious person, but I'm a very spiritual person. And, this, and, and in the text it says, all you need to have is the faith of a mustard seed. Now, how many of you all in the audience have ever seen what a mustard seed looks like? I mean, so, you know, it didn't even say you need to have the faith of an apple seed. It said the faith of a mustard seed. <laughs> and if you believe in it that wholeheartedly, you will ultimately give it your all. But risk and the, and the visualization of risk oftentimes precludes us from doing anything that we ultimately feel we are destined to do. So if I had to leave you with some information, with, with the, with the idea relative to risk and its impact on ultimately who you want to be, risk is only as big as you give it power to be. Um, yeah, I, was, um, I was a professor at Yale for about seven years. And w one of the things that we, we, we did at Yale um, was that Yale is, has a, a three 12 week trimester system. And students take three courses, four courses per trimester, usually three. For each one of their, well, for my class, my class in social science, they were reading a book a week, per week. 10 weeks, one book a week. Where am I going with this? If you really want to make a difference in this world, if you, if you want this new earth, if you want to be creative, you have to become committed to knowledge. Mm -hmm. You've got to read. You, and, and then you have to reflect. The other thing, and this I tell all of my students, if you're an undergraduate student, before this whole thing is over, 
go abroad and study somewhere for at least a semester. Preferably go somewhere that is very different than you. Now see, I didn't have to do that because I'm an immigrant, right? Perhaps the same thing with you. But I can tell you what the advantage is of going somewhere and learning the culture of other people. And really, you're not learning the culture. You're learning the ability to look at the world through the eyes of a different culture. And see, the beautiful thing about me is that I see the world through different cultures. This language that I now speak so fluently is my second language. I can do this thing that I'm doing right now in Spanish. In other words, I can represent humanity in at least two languages. I can see things and it matters. I'm telling you, it matters. There are things, even right now, after all these years that I lived in the States, there are things that I do not understand about American culture. They make no sense at all to me. And then there are times, particularly when I'm writing, that words come up to me in Spanish and then I cannot find the English translation because there is no connect. But it only reflects that this is the beauty of the world. See, we're, we're very patriarchal in one sense, very you know, male dominant, but at the same time, we're, we, we are so limited. We know the world through the eyes of men, and we only know the world through the eyes of our society. And yet there's so many societies in the world, so many nations, so many cultures. That's taking a risk. That is saying, look, I'm going to go abroad somewhere. I'm going to go to Brazil. I'm going to go to Costa Rica. I'm going to go to Spain, wherever. Uh, go to England, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but experience the reality and, and see, this is, this is the beauty of differences. Right. Differences bring us closer together than separate us. I mean, it sounds ironic and contradictory, but that's what it does. So let me, let me ask a question of the audience. By a show of hands, you know, Dr. Padilla talked about going abroad. How many of you all have just ever crossed over one of the bridges here in the city and went into a different neighborhood? <laughs> And I'm not, I'm not talking about one of the plush neighborhoods. I'm talking about one of those, one of the neighborhoods north of the city that you hear about on the news all the time. Not so many. So you can just cross the bridge and take a left of downtown and find a whole different culture right here in your own city. One of the things that I do for students, and particularly UNF students, when I come out and I lecture, and then I have them come take a walk with me in the neighborhood that I work in for a couple of reasons. One, to let them know that their, their definition of urban communities is often defined by what they hear on the latest hip hop CD and or the vision that they have from the TV show The Wire. I mean, that defines how you look at urban people. And, and what we've come to know is that's really not true. So the risk for many of you all is to not only step outside of yourself and enjoy a whole other culture abroad, but do it right in your own city. I mean, you have no excuse for not doing that. And that could be a risk that you could take today. All right, with that, we're, we're running out of time. So let's open it up for Q&A. Um, and feel free to ask any of us, the panelists, any questions? We have two microphones, one here and one over there. Okay. You have someone right here. Come on down. All right. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah, we can hear you. Awesome. Uh, obviously, you guys are very deep into self-reflection, authenticity. When you're alone, what are certain like kind of self-reflective things that you ask yourself or? things that you think about to reach that moment of self-realization? 
Well, you know, for me, there, there is no one particular thing that I try to focus on. Uh, I, I just let it come. You, you know, this is, we, we got to get to the point that we, we trust ourselves enough to allow our natural vibrations, our natural energies to communicate with us. You know, I don't want to impose anything. You know, when I have a thought, I, I want to let that go as soon as possible because I, I just want my body to speak to me. So I really don't have anything in particular. And, and, but yet, what gets communicated is it, immeasurable. Right. You know, because you're not expecting it, and it's deep. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's insightful. It tells you things that you never imagined, you know, so. You know, it's, uh, for me, much like Dr. Padilla, um, when I try to own that thought that comes to me, I never can put words around it. So, you know, if you read my blogs, they all come at moments where, you know, I, f I find myself sitting in front of the computer and it just spills out onto the computer. And it's just for me, I'm just kind of shaping it and putting it in a form where it's articulate to other people. But those moments of clarity come when they come. I don't have an agenda associated with them because I assure you I've been trying to write something for the whole month of October and it just wouldn't come and so you know those moments of self-reflection come at the most inopportune times when I'm running down the street or you know I might hear something or see something my spirit speaks to me and it allows me to say this is what I need you to say to the larger consciousness of the world yeah and let me ask something really quickly because I, we're not here talking about you know, um, ways of, of, of getting to doing self-reflection, but we did mention meditation. I don't want you to think that that is the only way that it happens. Right. There are multiple ways. Uh, look, I, I used to be a runner, uh, and, and sometimes, uh, I mean a serious runner, uh, you know, sometimes I'll get into that, you know, that 50 mile uh, period, oh my. and all that stuff would start coming. Right. <laughs> yeah, it started coming. Now, you know, one of the things that I do, um, I, uh, I, I cook. Uh, I, I cook Puerto Rican food in silence. And it's amazing how all kinds of thoughts are coming, all kinds of ideas. No television, no radio, just me in the kitchen with my stuff. Uh, yoga, a wonderful, wonderful way. Of, of self-reflect, uh, prayer, I mean, name it. There, it's not just one way, there are multiple ways. But you need silence. The point is, silence is the key. We have a couple more questions Thank you. there. Going to the effect of emotions that you talked about, um, oftentimes our connection to emotions and whether we should or shouldn't be is placed on us by societal norms. And we know that when we break those, oftentimes people become uncomfortable or even angry. So my question is, have you dealt with opposition of that kind and what have you done to kind of counteract it or deal with it? Oh, uh, that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you see, uh, asking me that question is, is, is probably, I'm not the best source because I, I really believe that I'm crazy. <laughs> be, be, because I do crazy things. I follow my emotions. Uh, of course, you know, I ask my mind for its opinion, but for the most part, see, the, 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 the thing with emotions is that if you linger on them too long, the mind is going to change your mind. It's going to tell you not to go there. Um, but it's, it's all risk, you know. How willing are you to take the risk to follow that emotion that just showed up? Yeah, I mean, that's the key, and, 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 and again, you know, like you said, we, we need a job, we need an income, and on and on and on. Um, but there are a lot of other things that we need, and, and some of those emotions oftentimes communicate to us needs that go beyond the ordinary needs. But the question is, are you willing, are you willing to take the risk and follow the emotions? And you know, there might be some negative consequences, you know, uh, I, to give you an example, and, and I know we're running out of time, but this is one of my favorite examples. Um, Michael Jordan, because I lived in Chicago, and, and uh, but 
Um, Michael Jordan, for those of you who do not know him, is a, a former a basketball player. <laughs> and basketball is a game that we play in, in the United States. Uh, and, and during the All-Star game some years ago, he decided to take the risk that he was going to dunk a basketball from the free throw line. And that was in him. It was eating at him. And his friends are discouraging him. He said, I'm going to do it. The game of basketball changed with that. It's never been the same. You see all these players trying the most incredible moves. So much of that can be accredited to that. You know? So that emotion that you have could have implications for the entire world. You know, you, you never know. should go on and speak Spanish to piss people off. Because <laughs> <laughs> American only talk. And no. Um, well, you know, the, the course is no different than any immigrant coming from any part of the world. You, you, you got to really know the society. You know, uh, you really have to integrate into everybody. I mean, regardless, you have to fully integrate into the society. Learn the English, learn the language well, learn the culture well, learn the values well. But in your case, make sure that you retain that other part of you, right? I mean, it's very simple. It's, 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 it's not a very difficult formula. I'm here in the United States. I need to speak the language. But since I'm here, I must as well learn it very well. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. My, my dad, um, I came here with the intentions of always leaving, of, of always going back, what I call return home, right? And he lived his entire life in the States, always thinking that he was in Puerto Rico. It did not work very well for him. But that was the, the typical immigrant idea. If you study the, the, the history of immigrants, they all wanted to go back. And as a result, they never, they never were able to, to, to put their, their, their two feet deeply into the culture. That is something that we must do. But again, keep that other side. The, the one thing I would piggyback on that to tell you is that, you know, as we move to a global society, the thing that, and I would caution you on identifying yourself as an immigrant. I mean, you know, you got a leg up relative to the transition to a global society because you come from one you've learned another one and now you have the ability to integrate into others you know what it takes to get from your point a to point b and for those of us who haven't had the luxury of living in a different society as we move closer and closer to this global economy we're behind the eight ball yeah. So I, I think what you have to be very conscious of is turning what the larger message that you hear daily around immigrants and immigration, you have to be very conscious and turn that into a positive because for those of us who are, um, are, are steeped and deep rooted in, in this whole thing that we call, I call Americanism, I mean, we're moving to a global economy and a global society, and how's that going to serve you when you're living abroad or you're having to do business abroad? And so, you know, I, I say to you, embrace that piece of you that has already given you one leg up in a global economy and in a global society. Mm -hmm. 
I just want to add something to that. Um, we take study abroad trips frequently from the Kagan College of Business, and we go to South America, Europe, uh, Asia, China, and I participate in them frequently. I've taken students to China, to Germany, to France, and the reason I do it is just for the look in the eyes of students that have never heard people around them speak another language except English. So we get off the airport at Charles de Gaulle in Paris, and everyone around you is speaking French. They're using euros to buy coffee. And for American students, that, that one instant where you realize English is not an international language, kind of it, it really hits you. But, but, but just kind of one takeaway is, is that no matter where you are in the world, what culture you're a part of, what society you're a part of, you have to respect those local traditions, those local cult, you have to respect, there's no one language, one culture, one currency, one set of norms that's better, right, or, or correct, right? Everyone has their own way of doing things and there has to be that mutual respect in some sense. So. We have one more question? Okay. Yeah, we do. No, I would I would say the biggest there are two really one is us and two the ability to see the humanity in someone else we are so vested in seeing the difference in other people whether you know and, and given that we're in a political climate we are vested in that person's a Republican that person's a Democrat that person's black that person's white that person's an immigrant we we have so much time and energy vested in seeing the differences in each other that it precludes us from truly being a leader when you get to that moment of self actualization you know you have the ability to see beyond all of that and try to get to what I call the the good part and the good part is those things that we share in common and it might take it, it might take a little more energy on your part but there is that one thing that we can all agree upon and then building upon those agreements if you were to see me and my best friend we don't agree on anything I mean you would probably think that we hate each other but there's that one thing that we agree on and at that moment when we start to get sidetracked we go back to that and so I think that that's where true leadership comes in particular of organizations or just being the leader on your block what is that one thing we can all agree upon and if we can agree upon one thing we can build upon that and it may become that moment where we all need to continue to be lifelong learners and so while I disagree with you, I need to learn why you feel the way you feel. And so that's how I, I think that you know, we get beyond this point of seeing and identifying with the differences rather than the thing that we all have in common. I'll, I'll say my, my piece really quickly. I, I, it, it also starts with a sh this, this shift in consciousness, a shift in paradigm. And, and we have to ask ourselves, do we, do we really live in a friendly universe or a universe of fear and violence and hatred, you, you know, which one of the two do you really believe that we live in? And as long as we're not working towards this friendly universe, what we're doing is pretty much depending on old paradigms to continue our lives. For example, individual competition, domination, control, envy, hatred, those are the things that have brought us to where we are right now. That doesn't sound like a, a friendly agenda. So as I think about this new earth, what are, going to, what are going to be the defining 
characteristics of the way that we live our lives. You know, we try to bring peace to war. That, that is, I, I don't understand that. Right. So we have to move from, and this is why I keep talking about this whole idea, we have to become learned. We have to learn more and more about who we are. How do we get here? So much conquest, right? So much destruction. Some of us still believe in that stuff. I think we're so, out, out of time. Sorry, Tika. But, but we'll, we'll be here for, for a while if you want to answer questions later on. or uh, Sure. Yeah, communicate. But thank you for, okay. for sharing your ideas. And thank you for being here. Uh, before we transition into um, lunch, I wanted to again echo the thanks. Can we give another round of applause, please? Thank you. Dr. Gold, Dr. Padilla, Dr. Cohen, thank you. Um, the way we're going to do lunch is we're going to have Dr. Daywood, who is um, on my right, your left, in the back corner. Please raise your hand, Dr. Daywood. There she is. Very joyful. Um, she's going to come by your row and um, situate uh, you with lunch. So we're going to start with the back and then move our way front. Thank you.